Most people don't associate the Great Depression with a tremendous amount of growth in the visual arts. But what you're seeing right now is just a small selection of the thousands of new American art pieces that came about during the Great Depression. And all of this was possible because of just a few government programs designed for the creation of public art. The 1920s were one of the most glamorous decades in American history. There was plenty of new music, fashion, and developments in technology. American artists benefited from the economy, but they were still very dependent on wealthy patrons. The most popular art produced at this time was inspired by work that had been created overseas in Europe, and artists did not often pull subject matter directly from the American landscape or history. Art reflected the high-class lives of the wealthy, or were formed with well-established subjects like landscapes. Artists were a pretty scattered group that still needed the favor of the rich to achieve individual success. Looking back, it's hard to believe that all of this great extravagance could come tumbling down. And yet, it did. In fact, it all began to fade away on October 29, 1929. Black Tuesday, the day the stock market crashed and the Great Depression began. It was an economic catastrophe, with 25% unemployment, a slash national income, rampant bank foreclosures, and long lines at soup kitchens across the country. Artists suffered along with everyone else. They found it difficult to continue in their creative experiments as almost no one could afford to commission artwork. And then, when all seemed lost, This great nation will endure as it has endured will revive and will prosper. So first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Franklin Delano Roosevelt was inaugurated in March of 1933, and in his famous first 100 days as president, he created a widespread and comprehensive reform and relief program known as the New Deal. The New Deal was full of new government agencies, most of which targeted unemployment in the failing economy, though there were some that reformed the banks and insurance policies to prevent another economic collapse. One of the most significant programs, and the largest of them all, was the Works Progress Administration, the WPA. Headed by Harry Hopkins, a close advisor of the president, his primary goal was simply to get people back to work. Beginning in 1935, the program mostly funded construction-oriented public work projects, but by the time the program was shut down, almost every single community in the United States had at least one public site that had been worked on by members of the WPA. A few months after the program's creation, Harry Hopkins expanded the focus of the WPA to include artists. His proposal was known as Federal One, and it created four subcategories for unemployed artists. There was the Federal Theater Project, the Federal Writers Project, the Federal Music Project, last was the Federal Art Project the first federally sponsored visual arts project in history. No one really today can put together, in a sense, realize how much it meant in the history of art in, in terms of American culture. There were no jobs and there was nothing going on except poverty. And the WPA took care of that and gave them something stable to work. The Federal Art Project, the FAP, was run by Holger Cahill. At its peak, the FAP provided jobs for over 5,000 painters, sculptors, photographers, and printers, a remarkable feat at a time when most people struggled to find or keep a job. The Federal Art Project had three main goals. The first was to create art for the public in a new way. The Federal Art Project also aimed to implement art education in local schools. FAP workers were employed as teachers for aspiring artists and students. Last was to integrate art into the community with neighborhood art galleries and traveling art shows. This was especially significant for Americans living in rural towns that never had the opportunity to see or learn about art before. The art was displayed in public settings, such as in schools, hospitals, and post offices. Artists began to turn away from European influences and focus on national identity. The uniquely American inspirations came to be known as the American scene. But because American scene is such a broad term, artists understood the concept in different ways. It was a kind of a catch-all phrase that was never really defined. 
And at its broadest, it um, encompassed subject matter drawn from American history, American mythology, um, American culture, and everyday life. Uh, sometimes that could be totally mythologizing and nostalgic. Sometimes it could be much more critical. Uh, for instance, on the mythologizing end, you have these great murals at the University of Wisconsin um, that depict Paul Bunyan and his ox. On the other hand, you have artists like Thomas Hart Benton, who uh, actually depicted the KKK in his murals. And they, were, they were all controversial, but... The most important thing is that it provided such a wide range of responses to um, ideas about American identity and politics. Because artists were given freedom to interpret the American scene, some interesting new trends developed. For one thing, there was more of a focus on the lives of the working class in industrial environments. For the first time, artists as a unified group were acting as promoters of social change by creating art that displayed poor living conditions or societal problems. They were celebrating the experiences of the lower class in the most public settings, while being paid by a government agency. This kind of artwork would never have been allowed in the 1920s or any other time period. Both stylistically and politically, the art movement was revolutionary. Despite overall positive feedback from the public, not everyone believed that the Federal Art Project was a success. Although the focus of Republican opposition was on the Writers Project and the Theater Project, which were derided as supporting anti-American sentiment, the Arts Project nevertheless was frequently criticized as a boondoggle that subsidized lazy artists who worked irregular hours and produced work on an erratic timetable. Arts Project administrators fought against these charges, but they persisted until the project's end. Although it was not centered in one area of the country, the Federal Art Project did have a large presence in Chicago. One particularly Chicago-focused mural is located in Lakeview Neighborhood Post Office. The mural is titled Chicago, Epic of a Great City, and it was painted by Harry Sternberg in 1937. It is a prime example of the way artists were able to incorporate local history in their art. This mural displays the history of Chicago with a vertical timeline down the center. Fort Dearborn is shown at the bottom as the first settlement in Chicago. This evolves into the 19th century version of the city with images of the Chicago fire. Finally, at the top, this is transformed into the modern-day skyline of the 1930s. The timeline celebrates the progress through the change from a simple fort to a sprawling metropolis. Sternberg visually combines the agricultural power of Chicago with its modern determination in industry. Horizontally, the artist displays this industry and development with images of working industries like steel mills and a cow slaughter because the meatpacking business was so significant in the city's past. The choice to show the cow slaughter, I think, is a great um, example of how the American scene could encompass both everyday heroism and everyday brutality. Nobody would have ever thought that that was an appropriate way to decorate a, a public building before the idea of economic justice um, and the question of what constitutes American history and American culture and American values um, came to the forefront. And ultimately, that's what the Federal Art Project was all about. Artists cooperated with their government to create art that displayed their interpretation of American life. Some of it was positive, a postcard of the American dream. Some of it was negative and represented a visual plea for reform. Much of it featured the lives of those who struggled and worked hard every day. Finally, the largest section of American society was represented, even if it was at a time of great uncertainty and loss. Although the project lasted only eight years, all of this and the fact that artists were provided with jobs and relief by their federal government was unprecedented. A few generations ago, the people of this country were taught by their writers and their critics and their teachers to believe that art was something foreign to America and to themselves, something imported from another continent and from another age that was not theirs, something they had no part in. But recently, within the last few years, they have discovered that they have a part they have seen in their own towns, in their own villages, in schoolhouses and post offices, pictures painted by their sons, their neighbors, people they have known and lived beside and talked to. They have seen rooms full of paintings by Americans, some of it good, some of it not good, but all of it native, human, eager, and alive. All of it painted by their own kind in their own country and painted about things they know and look at often and have touched and loved.